Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our conversation today with Father Thomas Joseph White. My name is David Albertson. I'm a professor of religious studies at the University of Southern California here in Los Angeles. And I'm also the executive director of the Nova Forum for Catholic Thought. Nova Forum introduces students to the Catholic intellectual tradition and shares that tradition's resources with the contemporary university. To see what we're up to, you can visit our website at novaforum.org or follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. Our programs are only possible with your generous support. If you'd like to contribute to our work with university students and faculty, you can visit novaforum.org slash donate. Let's get started. I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, who's joining us from Rome. Father Thomas Joseph White is the newly appointed rector at the Angelicum, the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome. A prominent American theologian, Father White directed the Thomistic Institute in Washington, D.C. and taught at the Dominican House of Studies there for many years. He's the author of several volumes, but most recently a wonderful book titled The Light of Christ, An Introduction to Catholicism, which I highly recommend. Today we have the privilege of asking Father White about the state of Christian intellectual life in today's universities and the challenges facing the secular academy. We'll also consider, I hope, the prospects of Catholic intellectual renewal, or even one can hope a renaissance to follow these difficult years. Father Thomas Joseph, welcome. It's wonderful to have you with us. Thank you so much, David. I'm really grateful to be with you all and grateful to be a, a hosted by the Nova Forum tonight, today in, in California. Yes, that is, this is maybe at the end of a long day for you, but thank you for being with us. Maybe we could start by learning more about your new work at the Angelicum. Can you tell us about your work there, the community of your students, and its mission in the life of the church? Well, the Angelicum is one of seven pontifical universities in Rome, so it's dedicated to primarily formation of um, not only future clergy, but future, you might say, Catholic intellectual leadership in the domains of philosophy, theology, what we call here in Europe social sciences, which is sort of like applied Catholic social doctrine in economics and law, and, um, and in canon law and on behalf of the Catholic Church. And so we are a, a small university of about a thousand students from 98 nationalities and with a very international professorial core, many Dominicans. And we teach a lot of seminarians, we teach a, a, a lot of uh, young priests doing doctorates, but also hundreds of uh, young religious women from congregations around the world and hundreds of lay people, including many of the young Americans who study here in Rome. That's fantastic. And it's great to hear about the, you know, the international diversity of the church where you are there. The Angelicum's, it's obviously a major center of Catholic education. It passes on the church's intellectual heritage to the next generation of teachers and leaders as you were describing. But the Thomistic Institute in the US, which I think you were directing through 2018, if I have it right, works with secular universities as well, a very different situation and sort of brings resources there that might not be uh, in different places in the academy in the US. Can you tell us about how your time at the Thomistic Institute shaped how you understand the contemporary secular university? What's the secular academy's strengths and weaknesses from where you sit? Where does it need supplementation? Or is that even the best way to think about Catholic presence in the secular academy, that it should be something of, of complementing or supplementing what's there? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, I, I ran the, the Thomistic Institute out of Washington, D.C. for 10 years, which basically starts student chapters for Catholic intellectual life on secular campuses. And we began at places like Harvard, Yale, Brown, Duke, University of Virginia, and now I think it's at 70 or 75 campuses. Um, I, I myself, you know, you might say my interest in this originates from the fact that I went to Brown University in the 1990s in you might you, in what you might call a, a highly charged uh, politically animated campus that was highly secular. And also my colleague who helped me start the Thomistic Institute campus chapter program who now directs the Institute Father Dominic Legg was at Yale Law School in the 90s. So I mean, this partly comes out of our experience as priests and, and uh, Dominican theologians uh, 
of the experience of the Catholic or the, the, the absence of a, a Christian intellectual formation in these kind of more secular but elite schools. And so by starting the chapters, what we our idea was to uh, bring uh, the riches of the Catholic intellectual tradition into the heart of the contemporary uh, non-Christian university culture and create non-conflictual and profound intellectual engagement around core themes, uh, questions of metaphysical truth, questions of fundamental ethics, uh, nature of human freedom, religious aspirations in human beings, um, the questions of the meaning of, of human existence, happiness, uh, death, uh, you know, values, uh, priorities, basically to create a, a sort of deeper philosophical and theological conversation rather than a kind of what I would call the dangers of a, the risks of a shallow Christian apologetics. And uh, we found that this has been a hugely uh, successful and growing you know, movement. But in terms of your question about the status of the university today, I would say that things have moved more and more towards a highly specialized um, research orientation among most contemporary secular academics or just academics in American universities, where people are highly um, qualified to speak about very particular topics like you know, Descartes' conception of physical motion or um, paleon paleontology paleontology uh, studies of um, you know African uh, ancestors of contemporary human beings 70,000 years ago in in you know Kenya or something and you know or you know contemporary Spanish literature or uh, 17th century Chinese political theory or something you know so the thing is that that's really rich in one sense but in another way what's lacking is in, in an integrated formation of the human mind to gain a kind of a, 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 a larger orientation concerning um, the nature of the human person, what unifies human cultures across time and place, aspirations to universal truth, and a framework for treating larger ethical questions, to say nothing of deeper religious uh, themes and issues. And you know, I think what's one of the key points of reference in terms of bringing back unity, that's a hugely controversial question, but I hold a kind of traditional position that's itself in the Catholic tradition controversial, that, that philosophy really has a, a very important unifying role and not merely, as it were, merely theology. I think theology has a, a role in giving a unified vision of the world, but I think actually uh, the classic scholastic perspective you find in Aquinas that metaphysics is very important and a kind of universal ethics that stems from, from metaphysics and also a vision of the human person. Uh, it's kind of rich philosophical formation that gives unity to learning. That, that's kind of what I worry is missing. Mm -hmm. And then, you, you know, you lack often a kind of deeper existential horizon. I'm sure we'll talk more about this, but it seems to me, you know, when you have hyper-specialization and fragmentation of learning, then the question becomes, what is the motivation for the university experience? And in the absence of a deeper unity to knowledge and a, and a, and a kind of more profound uh, formation of human meaning oriented in some towards some horizon of ultimate purpose. What often becomes the case is that the formation is is a kind of a a pathway towards habits of excellence that uh, that allow you to access to professional jobs. And so it's it's a, effectively a kind of highly highly uh, er, an erudite formation for uh, how would you call it an elite form of technical school. Because you're, you're basically learning in all these different disciplines, uh, technical habits that are going to allow you to then uh, become a, a, a protagonist in the marketplace and in the technological and economically motivated you know, work zones of our world. And that, that worries me because then you have intellectuals basically running through these hoops in order to eventually join into a, a, basically a set of you know, practices around industry, which aren't evil in themselves, but just aren't necessarily an adequate to what the university like that's probably not elevated enough horizon for the university ultimately yes these um i'm glad you raised the, you know these difficulties about the unity of the student's experience the unity of the of a sense of or the sense of a universality of human experience that would allow a coherent curriculum to help the students make sense of their um their time in university which sometimes as i think a lot of universities maybe catholic and non-Catholic in the United States experience. It's both a moment for the students to confront existential questions about who they will be as formed adults. And at the same time, this, like you say, this sort of, you know, high octane vocational training for participation in the marketplace. 
And they're not always clear how they put those two things together, whether it's you know, some theological perspective or some philosophical, metaphysical unity that can be found. As a colleague of mine likes to say, we've lost a sense of the, of the universitas, you know, of the whole, of, of what the university could be. But it's remarkable to see the, you know, the longevity of these different, like Bonaventure with theology as, as the source of the unity or the, the Dominican, the Thomistic tradition of finding philosophy there. So I hope you can come back to a lot of these different problems. One, one question I wanted to ask at the outset is where to begin with students? You know, if let's say you have a population of Catholic students who want to take part in the Thomistic Institute's activities or some other sort of center of intellectual formation for them as Catholics, the Catholic intellectual tradition is no small thing. And a lot of our Catholic university students are beginning more or less from scratch, however, in their explorations, often without a real grasp of some fundamental Catholic beliefs, or at least a sort of, you know, regardless of their own commitments and enthusiasm, that some of them lack kind of a map of basic coordinates of understanding um, Catholic tradition. In your book, I noticed a lot, in your book, The Light of Christ, you think a lot about this problem of starting points. You know, is it best to start with revelation and authority? Is it best to start from reason or from beauty and natural desire or liturgical and sacramental formation? In your experience, what are some you know, doorways in or touchstones to return to where students can be introduced to the Catholic intellectual tradition? What, what, what are some good starting points or some possibilities there, especially if they haven't had the kind of catechetical formation that one might hope for before arriving at the shores of whatever university that they're at? Yeah, so I think you can talk in, in some sense about intellectual witnesses on the one side, and then on the other side, what I would call principles, you use the word coordinates, which is a wonderful word too. And what I'd say about witnesses, intellectual witnesses is, when you're starting out to kind of in, investigate the Christian intellectual life, you, you partly need to see it done well and, and rightly by some great um, instantiators of the tradition. You know, so uh, you some people have, People, and this allows different doorways, you know, so some people like start reading someone like Joseph Ratzinger, or some people read Augustine's Confessions, uh, or others read John Henry Newman, you know, his uh, Apologia Propia Suta, uh, Sua, like wh why he became Catholic, or um, someone like Hans Urs von Balthasar, or uh, uh, Edith Stein, or Elizabeth Anscombe, or, you know, maybe with more difficulty to begin with, Thomas Aquinas, but the point is, you get a doorway in and someone gives you a perspective about a sort of vision of reality in the light of Christianity and in a Christian light, seen in a Christian light. And I think that that's a, that's a kind of first invitation to see that there's a, a kind of powerful intellectual tradition at work and there's a polyphony of voices. It's not simply monochromatic or ideological or you might say narrowly um, defined, but there's also some kind of also definitions in scape uh there's a kind of real form to christian thinking there's a kind of beautiful discipline and also a great field of openness and once you start to sense that in these great christian intellectuals it's in, that's a first invitation so that's what i'm calling an intellectual witness the person who invites you to think in a, in a sort of much larger way about the world uh, in a luminous way in light of christian teaching and, and divine revelation and then i think there's what's called you know principles or coordinates as you say and that's really getting a, a first formation, an initial, an initiation into basic philosophical and theological principles. And that's a little different. I mean, I, my experience is that Christian intellectuals need definitely need both. They need on the side of revelation to see that there are really are teachings about the creed that are beautiful and profound and illuminating, and that there are great voices in the Christian tradition to make sense of the world in light of divine revelation. Divine revelation enriches our understanding. We don't receive a divine illumination in faith that makes us stupider. We receive one that makes us much more intelligent and it elevates us and it helps orient us internally towards sound and reasonable practices, towards intellectual maturity, moral maturity, towards freedom and happiness, and including happiness of the mind, happiness of perspective and contemplation. So I think, you know, one thing is to, is to be open to revelation, not just like in some kind of voluntaristic or emotional way, but intellectually by studying uh, Christianity. And that means studying scripture and catechesis and the catechism of the Catholic Church. But it also means like uh, 
looking into the theological traditions as articulated by great theologians. And, you know, I think the Thomistic tradition of Thomas Aquinas and his commentators is extremely rich and helpful. And then in philosophy, I think that's a different thing because you're really actually trying to find first principles that allow you to be very autonomous intellectually. And for me here, the master historically is really Aristotle, because I think once one starts to understand the principle of non-contradiction and the sort of distinction between a thing and its properties, or to use the technical word, a substance as accidents, then ideas like nature and natural capacities and natural powers and causation and the four causes, you know, efficient, formal, uh, uh, material and final causality, these, these seem like less abstract and actually quite applicable and realistic notions that help us describe all kinds of things uh, or to actually give greater analytic depth of description and analysis uh, and understanding to the things we experience all the time more intuitively. Uh, and, and so I think with Aristotle or Aristotle's read by Aquinas, the mind can really gain purchase on reality. And once you start to make progress in philosophy, and you see it's not arbitrary, it's not an authority structure, there is a kind of autonomy of the mind, like conquering for its own, uh, on its own, a kind of deeper uh, intuition and understanding and insight into reality, then, you know, you really, you, you start to gain great confidence that the intellect has a purpose. It's not just there to be indoctrinated. It, it actually, there's a kind of way for the mind to to, to do it in self-discipline, investigate reality and explore it, you know, and I think that's a really important aspect of Catholic intellectual life. That's so interesting because you're, you're saying it's the, it's by looking to the Catholic tradition, especially Aristotle Aquinas and his commentators, but the students can get a sense of their own autonomy as thinkers. This is something that, you know, used to be sort of laid at the foot of people like you know, Kant and the Enlightenment, that this is where you find autonomy as a thinker. But in my experience too, it, it's not, that's not really the case. There's such a fragmentation at the universities um, in terms of different perspectives without any attempt at resolution or leave, even the sort of the project of a possible resolution being placed at the feet of students as a task for them. Because that's not happening, that they don't always exit with a sense of their own autonomy. It's sort of a sense of maybe affiliation, right? That there's different perspectives that are in competition and their job is to affiliate with one of these different paradigms or perspectives rather than getting a sense of their own long-term fitness for an intellectual journey of their own, of their own direction. Yeah, I mean, I would, to say something maybe too, too, too simplistic and too aggressive, but maybe just as, an, as, an, as a brief idea. You know, I think that the first radical modernity stage with Hume and Kant, in terms of the skepticism of the treaties of Hume and the critique of pure reason of Kant, when you start to in, inseminate fundamental doubt about causation and nature and the capacity to know things and insofar as they exist around you, it seems like you're creating greater autonomy for the intellect because you're doubting the great uh, metaphysical traditions of the past and the grand philosophical realism of the scholastic tradition. But by imprisoning yourself in skepticism, you can actually create a lot of self-doubt and um, destructure the intellect. Uh, so it's very difficult, I think, then to build on that foundation some kind of secure and universal form of thought that can be shared between persons. Immanuel Kant wants to do it through a, a universal ethics, but an ethics without a philosophy of nature, a philosophy of human persons, and a philosophy of being is very precarious. And then I think in the second cycle of modernity that's more radical yet, you know, after Nietzsche problematizes Kant and ridicules him uh, for thinking he can still maintain, you know, platonic universal certitudes, even after he's himself attempted to demolish skeptically the foundations of, of realistic thought, uh, classical realistic thought as it at, at least aspires uh, to, to characterize itself, you know, then what Nietzsche does is he creates essentially the conditions for what you're talking about. The supermarket of ideas where you have all kinds of traditions, perspectives, uh, um, ideas that uh, compete with one another, but you don't have necessarily the confidence you can adjudicate between them. And then what you get are tribal loyalties and Ertzat's uh, intuitive emotivism where I, I associate with this group of people, I associate with that group of people, this professor or this witness has a tremendous power over me. So I, you know, I feel like I have reasons, I don't have a, I have a kind of a pre 
pre-rational uh, intuition of why I associate with them. And that's, you know, that's, that can be understandable in, a, in the short term as a way to kind of gain a first um, discipline of the mind to follow someone. But in the, in the end, that, that can't really stabilize the mind or create autonomy and good judgment. You know, you, you have to get back to the principles in the reality themselves that liberate the mind to say, you know, I'm, I'm discovering the truth for, for myself and it's, it's stabilizing me. And I, I think in the skeptical and the postmodern uh, cycles of radical modernity, I don't think that you, you really can find those kinds of pathways of intellectual stability. Yeah, this is great. I mean, we're, we're, we're coming at two things at the same time. It's, it's about uh, what is the Thomistic Institute's approach to bringing Catholic intellectual life to universities that are secular in, in the ones that you outlined. And then also trying to diagnose, you know, what is the problem? Uh, what's the state of affairs? And how can we describe the intellectual experience of students given the current state of philosophical and larger inquiry, you know, intellectual inquiry in the academy today? Maybe we can come back to both of these in different dimensions as we go forward. But I wanted to ask about, um, you know, this sort of general orientation. You mentioned the, that sometimes for undergraduate students, at least, it can seem like their time at college or university can seem like a, a kind of elaborate vocational training for some you know, narrow participation in the marketplace. And that's, that's sometimes uh, there's nothing greater than that is presented to them or proposed to them. We know that universities in the past and many today at their best still offer a kind of unusual haven for the intellectual life that's removed from some market conditions. They reward the pursuit of truth. They foster contemplation. You can do, as you were saying, you know, 17th century Chinese literature or paleontology, and uh, that research can be supported in a way it might not be elsewhere in the economy. And each semester, I watch my colleagues mentor their students, put in great amounts of effort, tirelessly with great charity. But many universities, or many aspects of most universities, maybe today, are also driven driven by greed driven by envy sometimes, oriented to the market economy, oriented toward cultural prestige, more than to the formation of young adults. And as we said, even elite schools sometimes don't put together a vision of the whole for them and answer the question, what are all these existential concerns that I, in my early 20s, are, am confronting? What do these have to do with the major that I select, for example? In this sort of a situation, these conditions, how can Christian intellectual life enter into the students' experiences? What, where can we enter into this sometimes chaotic pedagogical situation? Is, is it best done by bringing in outside resources? Are there, should, should Catholics at different universities try to be fostering their own communities, their own resources? Should we think about student activities? Should we think more about you know, Catholic faculty? Probably the answer is all of the above. But I'm sure you have some experience from your time with the Thomistic Institute about some good footholds in the students' experience, uh, even when the classroom is not organizing these sorts of pursuits for them. Yeah, well, of course, that's a huge question. It's a great question. I mean, the first thing I would say is that the modern universities in the United States and, you know, the, a lot of the prestige schools that are either um, state schools or important private institutions that massively affect the culture. They have important traditions of excellence in the you know, intellectual and academic. And you know, one of them is that some of them are, you, know, you might say, more formal than in terms of material content. That is to say, like teaching excellence in writing, uh, teaching people to read in a disciplined way. What is it to, to put one's mind to understanding a, a set of ideas in a given historical time frame framework of a, of a given time and culture, um, trying to understand how people debate with one another or how they depict things in various formats, philosophical or literary, uh, expressing oneself clearly both orally and in writing. Uh, you know, so, and also paying attention to a specific subject matter and being held accountable by one's colleagues, uh, being open to competing ideas. I mean, that there, is, there is a lot of intolerance in the contemporary secular liberal universities today, but there's also at times real forums still that exist where there's debate and, and mutual understanding and the, the, the research for the truth for its own sake in, in at least many important domains. So I'll say all that to say there's a lot that's good. 
And there are a surprising number of people who are not per se Catholic intellectuals, but are deeply aligned fellow travelers because they care passionately about the truth. They, they want there to be a place where they can be learning for its own sake. But, you know, competing with all this is, um, you know, the kind, what I call the instrumentalization of the human intellect for the purposes of either, you know, economy or political activism or, um, uh, yeah, personal success, or, you know, the, the, there can be various ways that academics themselves can be corrupted by primarily the pursuit of, of either uh, uh, greater funding lines and prestige or money and, you know, kind of honors. Yeah. So, and competition with one another can be extremely dissatisfying. So th there's a lot at stake and there's a lot of good and there's also a lot of ill. Origen, the third, the third century uh, Christian thinker said that you can take a brilliant intellectual person and with the, with, depending on their formation, they could become a great Roman lawyer or they could become a great contemplative in the Christian tradition. And so a lot depends on like the kind of formation they receive and where they choose to go in their, in their heart as well as their mind. John Henry Newman in his 19th, 19th century master work on the university, the idea of a university said that, you know, however great the servile arts are, and by these he meant to indicate things as noble as law and medicine, they still serve a practical purpose ultimately. And they're not, he thought, uh, identical with or adequate to the liberal arts, as he called them, which are uh, those, those disciplines in which we study the truth, pursue the knowledge of the truth for its own sake. Now, I, you know, I think the pursuit of the truth for its own sake is, and the, the enjoyment of aspects of culture that are artistic and beautiful, good and true for their own sake, this is part of a contemplative disposition of the, of the university in the European and American tradition that is deeply dependent on the Christian origins of the, of the medieval university. That's a controversial statement, but I think that there are direct historical indications of that. I don't say it can't exist elsewhere, but I think that that is effectively where the universal traditions have come from in Europe and the United States. This Christian notion of the contemplative pursuit of the truth for its own sake. And I think it's sustained and helped in many ways when there is a deep religious interest in the contemplation of God and the love of God. So to go then to your practical question, I mean, I think students need first to, as it were, acquire first taste of this gratuity of the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake as a Christian pursuit in theology and philosophy in the Christian tradition, allied with a general cultural confidence and, and magnanimity towards all those who seek the truth for its own sake. All who are seeking the truth for its own sake in instance are, are friends with Christian intellectuals and uh, need to be respected and welcomed by them. And we can learn from them and learn with them as well as uh, maybe offer something to them. And so I think that that kind of galvan, people can be galvanized by the thirst for the truth for its own sake in the Christian tradition, and then learn magnanimously respect the challengers and the alternative views and the complementary views of non-Christian perspectives. And I think this is deeply allied actually with Eucharistic adoration and contemplation in the liturgy, because in the liturgy you learn, especially in, in, in Eucharistic contemplation, to use your mind, to nourish your mind with truth for the sake of growing closer to God, which is the ultimate speculative horizon. And, and God is the most inclusive truth because if, you know, God is the author of all other truth. And so by acknowledging the truth about God, you are automatically placing yourself in a disposition to welcome the truth about everything else. And loving God for his own sake as the first truth, and you know, it opens the heart to love truth for its own sake in an integral way. This is a you know, countercultural view, but it's absolutely the medieval view and I think, it's, I think it's absolutely the true and right view. And Aquinas articulates it very compellingly, and I think quite rightly or truthfully, that when the mind is really seeking God transcendentally, we might say, it's open in its thirst for transcendence to every more imminent, finite, or particular truth, and it wants to find the integrated relation of all of these. And so it acquires this, you might say, native magnanimity towards truth-seeking in the human community at large. Christian and non-Christian, but this is only really going to be sustained if there are habits of the heart, moving the heart by love and charity toward God as the source of, of illumination and peace and happiness and repose. So, you know, really to sustain a Christian contemplative intellectual life and therefore to, to sustain a more universally oriented intellectual life in general, you do need a, 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 a profound and beautiful liturgical experience that complements that 
And so I think the intellectual life and the liturgical practices of the church do integrally go together. I, I hear what you're saying to be, in a way, this is the space between the moral virtues and the intellectual virtues. There's, of course, you know, the theological virtues and the cardinal virtues, uh, but then trying to get in the, in the, um, the importance of what habits of the heart and what habits of the mind are the students developing in the course of their formation. And these are ones, as you're saying, that can be shared with other fellow travelers who are serious in their pursuit of truth as intellectuals, whether Catholic or not. I, um, I'm fond of sharing with my students too, like you were saying, that there are layers of our academic enterprise. I'm at a large private university in a major city. Um, but here we're in, you know, we're inhabiting cultural forms that go back to Christian monasteries, the cathedral schools, and then a layer of the German universities on top. So we've got sort of, you know, what, what is it to be a human in the young adult? I'm trying to find my way, ask these existential questions, but I'm also preparing for the marketplace. And then the faculty are running around doing research as well. And all these things are inhab you know, inhabiting the same physical and cultural space in the academy, but it's not always clear how they go together. And I'm wondering if the intellectual virtues or some of these, in other words, practices, as well as Catholic beliefs. You said the Thomistic Institute led the way in saying, let's not just do apologetics, but let's do a sort of longer term presence to supplement in dialogue with the finest universities. In addition to what one learns, I wonder if there's a role also for how one learns or ways of you know, reading observing, praying, resting, you were speaking of Eucharistic adoration or contemplation or conversion, you know, conversing in dialogue or remembering and memoria that are also important Catholic traditions to be preserved and to be shared with the universities. Do you think that that makes sense to think about? Absolutely. Let me tell you just a concrete examples. You know, what we did, what we started off with is what we are current, our typical practice at the Tomisk Institute in the, in the U.S is that we try to provide at least eight, you know, on-campus events per year for every campus. So that's like, you know, lectures with Q&A afterwards. Um, but when the speaker comes in, we often also offer a smaller seminar earlier in the day or the next day after, where you have maybe 12 students who read an article by the professor or an article the professors agreed to assign to them. And there's a, a, a deeper kind of seminar conversation. But they also go out to the, the student leadership team goes out to dinner with the, the, the professor and just peppers them with questions, you know, kind of like the kind of conversations we're having where the, where the students can ask their questions directly. OK, but after you've had that cycle where there's a kind of exposure to professors at these multiple levels, we also do student retreats on the weekends. And that's where you're really inviting people into more Catholic framework of education where there might be, you know, two hours in the morning where you, you take pauses, you take Q&A, there's a, a real, you know, investigation of a, you know, say you're studying Aquinas on justice, because justice is a major, you know, area of, of controversy. What is justice? And you're studying a topic like that. Well, you're, you're pre the speaker's presenting on a justice, you know, and then there's some real discussion. There's pauses, but then there's like a social dimension. And then there's a time where there's perhaps a um, time to make some kind of pilgrimage to a chapel, depending on what city you're doing this. And you have mass, you have Eucharistic adoration, you give people time to rest and meet each other because they're young intellectuals who are trying to network, not in some kind of ambitious way, but rather to find like-minded souls who share common aspirations and to, to discover friendship because friendship is absolutely at the core of the Christian intellectual life because we are supported by friends, but the best and highest friendships are the, and the most supportive, therefore, are those grounded in the common pursuit of the truth and the, you know, a kind of ethical life of God. We often have a time of prayer, so there can be people build up a little bit their contemplative, adult religious contemplative life, adult practice of the virtues of religion, of adoration, prayer, penance, the sense of God's presence in their life. And then we have like, you know, very good social stuff where we invite students to have food and drink temperately, you know, wine. So the point is like to, to think that, you know, it's a balanced life of conviviality, of friendship, of celebration, of uh, you know, humorous discover of one, discovery of one another, of shared intellectual pursuits, of serious intellectual discipline, of Christian prayer. This is a totality. So when we put on like longer weekend conferences and people come and they see this kind of balance, they say, I've never been to an academic conference like this because usually people show up, they're very serious, 
they give a presentation, they argue with each other, and they all go off to different restaurants. There's no common prayer. There's no times where they have to talk to each other. You never talk to the professors if you're a graduate student. They're like gods isolated in a corner. And we, we actually try to put them together as a kind of community of, of, of conversation. And I think that's a Catholic spirit that's a lot more uh, integrated, you know, more holistic. And less utilitarian view of intellectual life. It's more um, convivial and and humane. And it, and it meets the. I think a lot of academics would say that sounds wonderful, and that that fulfills my own natural desires for what I wish intellectual life was too. That had that sort of integration to it. And you know, I promise to, to those of you who are joining us today, you know, live or watching this video later. Um, we didn't ask Father Thomas Joseph to say this, but this is what we're doing at Nova Forum, where we have our, our seminar, which then concludes with mass and then a meal for those who wish to join us afterwards, so that we have this, as you're saying, community and intellectual friendship between those on different stages um, you know, in, their, in their human journey and in their intellectual journey, the students and faculty together. I wanna take this uh, moment just to also say for those of us, for those of you who are here with us live today, on the topic of questions and, and good uh, conversation and dialogue together, we would invite you to take a moment to think of a question and share one in the Q&A uh, option in the webinar for Father Thomas Joseph, which we will be doing um, when we conclude our conversation here. We won't let it go without some chance for Q&A at the end. So if you could take a moment to add to those, we'd be most grateful and we'll look forward to hearing your questions and bringing them up at the end here. On this topic of virtues, Father Thomas Joseph, I wanted to ask about another tension because we know, you know U.S. universities, and you alluded to this a bit, but some people have characterized the situation today for students feeling fragile in a way, or at least that there, there is more intense politicization of some of the intellectual questions in the university. Sometimes quite, you know, I think fairly and importantly, but not just tensions over race questions or gender questions, but also about how dialogue ought to proceed. What's the place of vulnerability and risk mm -hmm. during intellectual exchange and dialogue? And I wonder if we could describe this as a sort of tension in process between different goods, different virtues in a way, between concerns of justice and mutual care for those in our intellectual communities of dialogue, but also seeking truth and a kind of intellectual freedom on the other. I wonder how Catholic intellectual resources, and maybe this is a place specifically for the Thomistic tradition, to help us harmonize between these different virtues, charity, but also truth. Is there some resources from the, from the Thomistic tradition that could help us in this situation where things seem more fraught than, than they have been perhaps in previous decades? Absolutely. I mean, I think, I think this is really a crux issue. And, I, you know, the study of justice is a very difficult topic. It, justice is a topic that's difficult, but with Aristotle and Aquinas, one can make immense progress and really come to understand different kinds of justice, distributive, commutative, social, or you might say integrative justice, um, and then their applications and how they relate then to various, various and diverse important human goods. And then how this provides for a structure for political engagement and then prudential application. So that's a lot to say, but let me, let me give some examples. The three kinds of justice Aristotle and Aquinas talk about are of the part to the part, the part to the whole, and the whole to the part. Uh, the part to the part is commutative justice. It's like, you know, I owe you so much and you owe me so much. It could be monetary. I have to pay you so much for this, this good or this service as injustice. But it could also be in a, in a community of egalitarianism, like we're participating in class together as students, and I owe it to you not to distract you, and you owe it to me to, you know, respect my right to be there, that kind of thing. The, heart, the part to the whole, so-called um, social or integrative justice, is kind of the right of the person to participate in the, in the common good. So, like, the child has the right to be part of the family, it can't be left on the doorstep. Um, or the parent has the obligation to be present in the family and can't simply abandon the family without injustice. But this is also true on a collective level. There's certain goods we receive from being part of an entire university life, and we can't just be excluded, even if we have defects of character, which everybody does, unless they're very, very grave and they are the common good in some special way. Um, but we also we have a right to participate, but we also have responsibilities when we do participate. 
certain ways of behaving. And then likewise, you know, the, the whole to the part, that's distributive justice. How does, uh, how does the university owe it to each individual member to distribute various goods and utilities to them? And what's the, you know, com the obligation that they have? Now, when you start with a very flat, if I may say so, Rawlsian conception of justice as something that's effectively born of the freedom of mutual human relationships in a kind of contractual way, like it's my freedom, I have the right to do what I want, and you have the right to do what you want, and you don't tread on me, and I don't tread on you, and this is the social contract, and we're going to fabricate a whole set of goods out of that. You're never going to be able to respect the complexity of human relationships just from this like micro instantiation of commutative justice according to, you know, freedom of, basically freedom of indifference, that I'm me being able to do whatever I want. That's just way too uh, minimalistic and too simplistic a theory of justice, and it's it's the kind of you know, might say philosophically um, vulgar or the vulgarization of the philosophical concept of modern freedom that we have, you know, that basically justice is a respect of the individual freedom of each one to do whatever he likes, so long as he doesn't hurt another. That being a negotiable space itself, what it means to really hurt another. And then you get these kind of, you know, negotiations about that. Once you start to think that it's about participating in a larger community and that we have flaws, you have to get into things like, uh, how we see the development of persons justly in this context of these larger communities. So, you know, take it, it's a good example to get education of a child. Children make mistakes. Parents cannot put them out on the street because of that. They have an obligation to try to teach the child the child has a right to be educated and to receive the truth, to try to seek the truth. But they also are going in the exercise of that, maybe make mistakes intellectually, make mistakes morally and ethically. And that doesn't mean they can be just be obliterated or they can just have a will of someone imposed on them. Now, when you get someone who's an adult, this is all the more the case that their autonomy, the exercise of their love, of heart, their desires, uh, is going to be a very big part of how they seek the truth and how they live with others justly. So yes, they have obligations of justice, but there's also going to be the experimentation of the exercise of their, the loves of their heart as they try to explore the truth, as they try to find what they believe is the case, as they try to negotiate ethical questions. And so on the one hand, you don't want a pure liberal libertarianism where they can do whatever they want and it's like a kind of over-sacralization of their liberal autonomy. But you also don't want a kind of uh, overly, um, I would say, you know, wooden you know, kind of totalitarian imposition of norms, maybe quite arbitrary norms or just like momentary culturally shifting norms by moment so that you can't really, so you impede their development. So then they, they practice conformity for the sake of social customs well, I must consent to that or I will be punished by the group. But deep down, no real formation has occurred because they haven't really explored what they think. They've just acceded to the, the, day, the, 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 the passing faddish catechism, the passing faddish, you know, ersatz customs. Uh, you know, so I, I think, uh, you know, basically finding a, a, an application of justice where you invite people to participate in the research for the truth in the university where there really can be differentiated viewpoints, differentiated consensus, uh, real argumentation, irremediable um, you know, discord about speculative views, and, and at the same time, mutual respect of love. One, one of the biggest confusions we have is, if a person is seeking a truth and coming to a different conclusion from me, they're, because they have a truth, you know, they hold to a pathway toward the truth different than me, they're incapable of loving me and respecting me. But this is not true. You can cultivate love, justice, respect, friendship, affability, even while you have differentiated views about ultimate ends or kind of you know ethical principles. And that's part of being an adult person and a philosophical person is to accept to live alongside people who have alternative views and not just like tolerate them, but engage and, and think with them and, and, and have conversations with them. And it's challenging, but it's part of human existence. Yes, the challenge is it's these it's these two related issues. It's the as you were saying, the, the fact that we can have radical disagreement and yet maintain a relationship of love, charity, concern, mutual care, even for you know, vulnerable members of, the, of, of, of one's intellectual community that you're disagreeing with. Um, and at the same time, there, there is though, a, uh, I think a, a question amidst these fundamental disagreements at a kind of ontological or even theological or anthropological level about what we are up to as human beings in the university with great, maybe greater diversity than in, in previous decades. There is this question of universality. Are we all doing the same thing? Are we all up to the same project? Do I, 
do I recognize what you uh, say you are doing when you are pursuing truth next to me in the academy? I wanted to quote for uh, those listening from an, an article that I found very fruitful. I think it was in First Thing, something that you wrote, if I could quote it for our, our, our intellectual community here today. You wrote, the church must restore to the human person a sense of the natural human capacity for the universal and with it, the possibility of an ennobling unity based on shared metaphysical truth rather than the negative piece of non-judgmental tolerance. So just to read that last phrase again, it's the possibility of an ennobling unity, a human unity based on shared metaphysical truth rather than the merely negative piece of non-judgmental tolerance, like you were describing of Rawlsian flatness, a great phrase, maybe we can all retain, that's a good one. But I'm, I'm wondering if I could push you on this for a moment about the status, the possibility of this shared metaphysical truth that can strengthen our understanding of human universality and perhaps make the kind of dialogues that we wish to see uh, more possible and more peaceful in the academy. But in the secular university today, is that kind of metaphysical unity still possible? Is that the, if I can press you on that, is that the situation that we're in? What's the place of metaphysical or philosophical, theological diversity in secular universities? Is, do you think, are, do you still hold out hope that we can get to this place of metaphysical unity that, that can establish a better um, universal society? You know, I, 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 I'm a little out of touch with like the inner, you know, life of this of the secular university, you know, in terms of like living there in the presence. My, my outward sense is, is that we're in a very, a very dire moment. And that the actual, although the universities are richer than they've ever been, there are more of them than there have ever been. And a higher percentage of Americans are, are in university than that have ever been. And probably I think it's the highest percentage of, of any of any country in the world. Uh, uh, in terms of the citizens, in percentage of citizens in America who go to university, the question of why the university exists or its its kind of future as a speculative enterprise of a place where truth is sought for its own sake, and that that has some kind of unifying effect, I think it's very very precarious right now, and um, so it's a paradoxical. Uh, but you know, sometimes things change, shifts in culture occur somewhat suddenly and unexpectedly. So I, I do remain hopeful. However, if I were like embarking on a different, slightly different vocation than I have, it's not a totally different vocation, but if I were in, in the university and I were like a 22 year old thinking about how to, to do what we've just been talking about, I think that the pathway is um, neo-Aristotelianism in uh, analytic philosophy because analytic philosophy can be quite ahistoric and it can shun this idea of building consent, sort of unity, integral methodological unity to the disciplines. And that's part of the reason you can have these problems. It's not the only, it's a contributing factor. It's by no means the only factor. But I think also in the contemporary analytic philosophy, you do find a new openness to the Aristotelian project. Uh, and, and so like the study of causation, natures, uh, the way that understanding human nature and human ethical action serves as a foundation for an analysis of justice and therefore an analysis of um, uh, the social order and the political life of the human person. And then if you ally that with Thomistic neo aristotelianism that the way that can lead to affability, charity, and social union through mutual love and friendship and marriage and happiness that comes from, uh, you know, relationships that transcend just obligation and enter into uh, the bonds, the bonds of of charity and 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 mutual human friendship, you know. So I, I think there's resources there, and there is an openness to talking about these things in the analytic philosophical world that can then serve as a bridge to talk to the other disciplines, like in poetics, say in literature, or um, in sociology as a kind of discipline allied with politics and study of human nature or um, uh, thinking about how the mathematical based, mathematically based natural sciences tell something about our human nature, but it's not comprehensive. And so you can start to think about how these different approaches to our experience can be united in the common philosophy of human nature and human ethics. I think a neo-Aristotelian 
approach to the universal is is probably the best pathway for the contemporary secular university. It's not going to be done by the majority, but you could have important minority voices who I think could be tolerated in the current political ethos and could make an impact. Uh, that's the best path forward I see. And I say that with a fair amount of, um, you know, stark uh, realism about the, about the situation, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, to highlight new Aristotelian resources is also to orient us toward tradition. And we speak about the Catholic intellectual traditions that we want to share with students and with the academy. But part of that is the idea of tradition itself, which is not, you know, which is sometimes um, a, a, an alien good in the academy and maybe not to be taken for granted, you know, especially in philosophy departments, which when they're analytically oriented, sometimes don't treat the history of philosophy, especially ancient and medieval, with the, you know, prolonged attention and, and rigor that one would hope. But I wanted to let, maybe we can come at this from a different angle about that idea of recourse to the past and recourse to tradition. And what does it mean to be, for example, neo-Aristotelian or to draw on virtue ethics or to draw on someone like Catholic philosopher, Alistair McIntyre and others. But to start with the idea of tradition, I've been very moved. I was rereading the apostolic exhortation, Christus vivit, Christ is alive from 2019 from Pope Francis, which is, you know, after the Synod on Young Adults, and it's addressed to young adults, and it's, it's uh, worth reading for those listening, I would commend it. And he, he speaks there, Pope Francis does, to encourage young adults to re rediscover what he calls the living riches of the past. And then he complicates, though, what a notion of tradition could mean. And this is, I would like to ask you about this. There's a, a, a passage that I'd like to read a brief passage from this Christus Vivit 2019. Roots, writes Pope Francis, roots are not anchors chaining us to past times and preventing us from facing the present and creating something new. Instead, roots are a fixed point from which we can grow and meet new challenges. We need to love this time. He means, you know, our time that we're in historically. With all its opportunities and risks, its riches and its limits. That's the end of the quote. There are different ideas about what tradition means. And here, you know, in the universities, to be sure, we've been speaking about, you know, philosophy faculties in particular, but even among different Catholics, different Catholics have very different senses of what it means, for example, to be in accord with tradition, to be traditional. How can we embrace the church's intellectual traditions from the past? And yet, as Pope Francis says, love this time with all its opportunities and risks, this balance between remaining with our roots, but also listening to the Holy Spirit and the demands of our own particular time. Yeah, well, let me pair, that's a great question. Let me pair, um, let me say a word about tradition first, and I might pair what you read about from Pope Francis with Alistair McIntyre, because I think there's some possible similitudes. Um, you might say that, you know, on one level, in terms of stances towards contemporary culture, traditions of wisdom that are substantive, that are real, that contain something for all human persons, they have a conservative aspect in the sense like, you know, ecologically, you have to preserve a, a rainforest that's precious, and you need to conserve a patrimony that's precious. So, a wisdom tradition like Thomism can be one that where you try to conserve a real understanding of what Aquinas himself taught. There's an in, in, interesting and important historical consciousness. You have to try to figure out what he really believed, think about different interpretations, and think about the riches of those principles. And then there's a kind of a progressivism in the sense that you want to see the living tradition progress. To conserve and to progress are kind of two aspects of a traditional minded person. And if you don't have some mixture of both of those, you go off. So to conserve but not be alive in your own era is dangerous, but to progress or to think that you're assimilating to the age you're in by you know, influencing it when in fact you don't conserve the, the, the classical principles, that's also perilous. So to be in some sense a conservative, to, uh, you know, a, a conservationist and a, a, a pro-life progressivist in the sense that you want the living tradition to thrive and it's and, and to be for pro means you know literally in Latin for 
to be for the life of the tradition in its contemporary moment. The second thing I'd say is, to, you know, when you look at what a tradition does intellectually, it does maintain classical and universal principles that are applicable for all times and places. And it also uh, dialogically or dialectically engages with uh, rival and alternative truths in its own historical moment. And Alistair McIntyre is very good about showing that. I mean, you, I mean, by making that point, you know, you so you take, for example, what is a human person? Well, Aquinas has a very different answer than more platonic uh, thinkers who sometimes posited in the high middle ages that there are two substances in man, a soul and a body. That's where Aquinas said there's one, we are one substance of a spiritual soul informing the body. We're one thing. I'm not my soul or my body. I am a, a I am a living personal animal. I'm a spiritual animal or a rational animal, or I'm an embodied person. You know, so that's a that's a that's a principle. If that's true, that's true for everyone, forever, as long as you have human beings. But then if you talk about contemporary neuroscience, well, Aquinas doesn't anticipate contemporary neuroscience, but can we put the Thomistic principle in conversation with contemporary neuroscience and think about the spiritual soul and contemporary neuroscience? That's a kind of new dialogical and dialectical project because there's gonna be people who study neuroscience and think you get a purely materialistic conception of the human person out of that. That's not true at all. It need not be true at all. But you can have all the gritty realism of contemporary neuroscience and the spiritual um, perspective on the human soul and immaterial operations of the human soul of intellect and will that's present in Aquinas. And these can be understood harmoniously. So a tradition is living because it maintains universal principles that engage us. And there's an aspect that the, the quote from the Holy Father uh, indicates that you that you um, read that you know is this is also related to love because tradition can be it, it is a refuge and it is okay to want to find some refuge and stability for the human person in tradition be it liturgical tradition or intellectual tradition because it gives you a certain kind of protection autonomy formation uh, identity and then at the same time tradition can't be a refuge in a way that leads you away from love from mission, from vulnerability, from suffering. Because the Catholic tradition is a tradition that follows Christ, that follows the apostles who gave their lives out of uh, love for God and love for the other members of the human race in a witness to charity that's universal. And that means to, be, to, to have charity that's universal is to be exposed to suffering and new encounter. It, and you, you witness to the apostolic tradition. We call it the apostolic tradition, the teaching of the New Testament, the teaching of the church. But to do that, you also have to imitate their very uh, principles, in, in, which involve the principles of charity by which they expose themselves to those who disagree with them, face confrontation, and even face uh, you know, physical violence and, and, and execution and out of love, out of witness, which we call martyrdom. So uh, you, know, you can't have tradition. Tradition is a source of stability, but it's also, uh, it pushes us out of charity to engage in the truth, to engage new issues to encounter them with boldness, with confidence, uh, rooted in principles, but also open to new questions and also open to communicating the truth with love in each given historical moment. And that means for us being contemporary modern people, accepting that, not being naive about that, and trying to bring the classical Catholic intellectual tradition into our contemporary modern moment to love the people who are around, to try to help them. Loving people can mean challenging them. It can mean disagreeing constructively with them. But it means bringing the, you know, the force of the truth out and also doing it out of love, you know, loving the truth and in the truth, loving other people. Yeah, I, I would take what you're saying to, to me. And I mean, tell me if you think this sounds right. The tradition becomes problematic. The tradi the, a, a allegiance or a loyalty to Catholic tradition becomes a problem or maybe even an idol when it, it is you know, matched with a refusal of suffering in exposure to the other, that when you greet the other out of a Catholic tradition and love, it can mean that you might have a hard time of dialogue there. You might be, you might, you know, there might be some experiences of aporia or disorientation or, or, or difficulty or disappointment or failure in dialogue. And that one has to bring that kind of, um, as you were saying, you know, Christian maturity to the appeal to tradition in dialogue. Yeah, I mean, tradition is an instrument for the growth in virtue, not an excuse not to develop virtue. And that's, you know, that's when you get intellectual Pharisaism or, or moral Pharisaism or aesthetic Pharisaism, when you, like, you know, you take a refuge. Now, I mean, of course, we have to admit, and I think it's important to say, you know, bluntly, 
there's also been a, a contrary trend that's been absolutely powerful to think that the church advances just to the extent that she renounces her own traditions in order to, in order to, in order to accommodate herself to the age. And what you're getting right now and more younger people is a, is a reaction against that and saying, look, look, don't rob me of my heritage. Um, this is, you know, we can't tear down everything from the past as if it's going to create stability in the, in the current moment, because the current moment is basically post-Christian and unstable. And so we need sociologically to recenter on core teachings, core truths, core practices, and we need to have a Catholic identity in the midst of the storm. Uh, and I, I'm very sympathetic to that too. It's just that to really do that project, you have to, you know, see the tradition as a vehicle for the growth in holiness and, and, and virtue, and not as, not as an occasion to, to, to uh, abscond from the obligation to follow Christ in virtue. Well, that's very useful. Tradition as a vehicle, just to echo your words, tradition as a vehicle for the growth in virtue and holiness. I want to let everyone know we will be turning to question and answer in just a moment. Um, I just want to spend one more minute on this question of tradition. And you referenced uh, Alistair McIntyre several times. McIntyre, of course, famously argues that essentially after the 19th century, there's only so many orientations that one could adopt to intellectual life in the academy. He calls them encyclopedia, genealogy, and tradition. And he contends, as you've alluded to earlier, that after the demise of encyclopedia, or essentially what Kant represents, the choice is essentially, he says, genealogy with Nietzsche and Foucault, or tradition with chiefly Aristotle and Aquinas. And he speaks about other Catholic philosophers, Catholic thinkers as well. Do you still think this captures the situation of Catholic thinking in the secular university today? Do you think that Catholics in the academy and other Christians are squaring off, in other words, essentially against Nietzsche's hermeneutic of power and his approach to history? Are there other you know, major uh, voices to, uh, that would compete with that? Or is that, is that, is that situation as McIntyre described it in 1981 after virtue? still essentially in effect 40 years later. Uh, I'll tell you, I think there are three competing narratives in secular intellectual culture today, broadly speaking. Uh, I would be wary of a premature declaration of the death of, of liberalism. I think that Kantian and Rawlsian liberalism is actually quite well and alive and is the essentially still the, the fundamental intellectual parlance of the international market economy and system of international rights that animates the project of, let's say, Northern Europe and North America, as well as a, a great deal of the rest of the world in, in trying to create, a, you might say, a globalized culture of exchanges based around commonly shared uh, understandings of human rights. That strikes me as a, a project based in a, in a thin anthropology, but a strong practice of the respect of human freedom with a very minimal commitment to what that really entails. And therefore you have a kind of moving terrain around what human rights really are. You've got the kind of waxing and waning of various rights depending on the powers of culture. Now that speaks to the, the force of the Nietzschean and critique and the postmodern critique, which is that there is something seemingly or possibly arbitrary to the construction of the notion of norms of human rights and the, the conditions of exchanges in, in modern liberalism. And so the skeptical framework established by various genealogists from Nietzsche to Foucault and Derrida is still extremely powerful. And I think in contemporary continental Europe, perhaps more powerful even than it is in contemporary United States, although it's definitely well and alive in the American Academy. Uh, and I think it's got a lot of contrary orientations opposed to the former uh, idea. And then the third idea is this kind of positivistic, scientistic naturalism that we're gonna explain the world primarily when we understand the core basic micro material structures of the human being through processes of physics, chemistry, and modern evolutionary biology. And that's the whole story. And once we explain you all the way from the micro bits up to the neurology, everything's going to finally be understood in terms of fundamental forces of physics. And there is no other you know, deeper meaning, but there could be some pragmatic operations about how we manage the human animals socially uh, for the greater you know, animal flourishing of the many in light of that scientific technological vision of reality. 
And that kind of mechanistic, naturalistic vision cuts strongly against the grain of the view of freedom as central in liberal tradition and also the cultural and the cultural construction of reality. And that is, you know, animates the project of Nietzsche and Foucault. Because of course, scientists don't believe it's all culturally constructed. And if it is culturally constructed and not and merely conventional, that's radical uh, sort of view radically contrary to those who are more positivistic and empiricist. Um, and so I think those three currents are deeply opposed to one another, mutually ideologically instable. In but they're all they're all animating the university, and in a kind of an unreflective way. I think they're kind of like, you know, the the waves under the surface as people are swimming in the in the in the shallow waters of the university, and they're being moved to and fro by those currents, and somewhat aimlessly, and not always not knowing which one's predominating, and then another one's predominating under a given aspect, a given moment. And so there's a kind of instability. And so I think the kind of challenge, the way I take the insight of, of McIntyre when he talks about tradition is, it's certainly not just authoritarianism. You know, I think that's an error to read it that way, or at least it would be an error for me. Uh, I, I think it's saying that, look, if there's a 2000 year old or actually more like, you know, 2,500 year old uh, philosophical project for dealing specifically with these kinds of questions of differentiated viewpoints, that starts already with the sophists in the, in the ancient Athenian uh, capital who said everything is perspectival and it's the imposition of the will to power of different ones. You know, this is right, this is book four of Aristotle's metaphysics to look at the challenge of perspectivalism and relativism and come up with principles that are applicable, that, that are basically stabilizing for all knowers in all situations and purposes. Well, I mean, so it's a tradition that's meant to lead you into an understanding of the structure of reality that can liberate you from these kind of, um, you know, the false coinage of sophists who occupy the public space and fill it with rhetoric that's misleading. And there are many of these people, ideologues, people who want to impose their own kind of grandiose vision, but don't actually have a foundation. There's not really a foundation in, in the reality or there's a skepticism about reality that's excessive. So I, I do think going back to the scholastic tradition, which is basically the project Al McIntyre is pointing out, looking at the metaphysical foundations and the moral foundations of human activity and like thinking about how that tradition can be challenged by these other newer, uh, I, I, you know, I, intellectual uh, I, ideas. That's very fundamental to take on all comers, take on all challenges, but then to explore ways to create a conversation and perhaps out argue constructively and solve the problems of the people who, you know, see things. I mean, it's true there's a cultural mechanic of the will to power wherein ideologically regimes favor certain discourses and views over others. And there can be all kinds of hidden, you know, motivations of the will and heart that are present there collectively and individually. That's a good Augustinian uh, observation, but it doesn't mean we're not also beings made for truth. And so you can take the truth of, so to speak, uh, someone like Nietzsche on the sort of the, the place the will is, is the role the will is playing in, you know, the privileging of certain normative discourses and culture. And you can also take the encyclopedists uh, aim at a universal knowledge by which culture can, you know, have a, a kind of genuine set of references everyone agrees on, and you can try to understand how these things are mutually, mutually true claims, secundum quid, or under an aspect, using the, the kind of, you know, scholastic tradition from Aquinas, then I don't even think it's that difficult. But, I, you know, I think that kind of thing is then a constructive way to react to what I would consider excesses in, in some of the contemporary traditions opposed to one another. Yes. The long view is so helpful, and you know, even as you know, even in the 1880s and 1890s, Nietzsche was writing specifically against the liberal. So you know, in so many words, the liberal tradition and uh, positivism. So the the what seems to be like sort of an immediate crisis of the university often has longer trails as well. This has been such a rich conversation. We want to make sure that we involve and invite in those who have shared so many good questions with us. So I'll just read some of those off and would love to hear whatever thoughts you have to share, uh, Father Thomas Joseph, to these different questions from our audience. I'll start with this one. When you discuss the Catholic intellectual tradition, how can we integrate it into our church to escape the culture wars the American church, this person wrote, has hunkered down in? We were speaking before we began and you shared that you know at the Angelicum you have about one in five or one in four students that were sort of overrepresented from the United States for all sorts of good reasons we can imagine. But how does the Catholic intellectual tradition, can it be a tool 
Should it be a tool to address, as this person writes, the culture wars uh, that the American Catholic Church is facing? Great question. Yeah, the answer is Thomism helps, but not just. Let me say a word about that. So first of all, you know, Aquinas follows Aristotle in saying, there are intellectual virtues, there are artistic virtues, and there are moral virtues. So, I mean, first of all, a lot of times when people start to get, um, you know, become rather ideological, they circle around just one of those domains. So everything becomes about dogma or everything becomes about your philosophical standpoint or everything becomes about liturgy or everything becomes about the architectural beauty of the church or everything becomes about this or that moral question. And the truth is, you know, all of it matters. And there's a kind of balance to have between all of it. Um, and, you know, I think that it's true. We need to believe everything the church teaches, but it's not just a matter of just an act of obedience of the will. It's also understanding in our minds what the church teaches and then trying to live it in, in accord with intellectual virtues, artistic virtues, and moral virtues. The other thing is that in the moral virtues, there are a lot of sub-virtues. I mean, if you open Aquinas' and Summa Theologiae in what's called the second part of the second part, which is the moral treaties, secunda secunde, he goes through a study of, you know, dozens and dozens of different virtues. Some are more political, some are more personal, some have to do with temperance, some have to do with justice, some have to do with the care of the poor, some have to do with, you know, uh, fidelity in marriage, some have to do with honesty, some have to do with fidelity to the teaching of the church, some have to do with the love of God, and some have to do with the love of neighbor, and you know, so much to do with hope as opposed to despair. There's a certain kind of vice that comes from people who are always despairing and therefore angry, bitter, and uh, and and basically joyless. You know, which is a kind of vice. So there's when you start to look at the taxonomy of virtues and vices in Aquinas, you can kind of get a much richer and more balanced sense of what's entailed. And then it's very humiliating for all of us to see how you know vitiated we are and how weak. But also, it's a great it's a great invitation to inspiration and to to, act, to aspire to something more full. I also think it's important to be both a dogmatic person intellectually. I don't mean to be dogmatic in the sense of rigid, but I mean to be intellectually informed about the dogma of the church and the Catholic social doctrine. There's a great compendium to Catholic social doctrine. Everyone should read it. I mean, once you see what they talk about in terms of a just and living wage, you can talk intelligently about the, the problems about what a just and living wage is in America today which is a debatable point among intelligent economic, economists and you know, experts in, in, in the domain, but at least you have the, the fundamental principles about what, you know, what it should be for a person to have a job that's not you know, sheerly exploitative, but really allows them to, to, to live their life and have a, a humane life or the right to an education, what that entails, or the, at least some kind of fundamental right to um, social health concerns and, and, and how you, you know, apply that could be debated. But, we can create great consensus around the principles. Uh, if, we, if we basically start with the principles of Catholic social doctrine, people that so-called on the right and on the left can actually often concede that those are all correct. I mean, that they're the good principles, including non-Catholics, I've found. Uh, so I think having knowledge of the tradition is really important because it's itself quite balanced. Aquinas on different kinds of virtues, different kinds of moral virtues, and the Catholic social doctrine as a dimension of the the the. The, the deeper dogmatic and you know you might say mystical vision of Catholicism in its in its revealed teaching. Well, there's two other questions I wanted to make sure we get to before we come to the end of our time that are from people in the academy as Catholics and are asking very more much more practical concrete questions about finding a way forward uh, with the Catholic intellectual life. One person writes. The modern academy is a place of speed and productivity for faculty and students. How can individuals desiring to maintain and foster a healthy Catholic intellectual life cope with the demands of this kind of university administration, especially speed, productivity, time management? It's a great question. I think one that a lot of us feel a kind of a, a, a pace of academic life that is not always compatible with the intellectual life, which is not always compatible with the spiritual life. What resources do you have, you know, from your from your experience at the Angelicum or working with university students, or what kind of advice would you suggest for those um, caught up in that sort of pace? Yeah, that's. I mean, it's a that's an that's a great question. That's a very humbling question for me to receive because you know, one of the great things about being in a religious order that is basically committed itself to non efficiency and um, and <laughs> yeah to like 
medieval customs is I have just the, the protection of my time. Now, I, I, currently as rector of the university, I mean, I'm, I'm running the university with the help of incredible staff. So, I mean, I, I have a lot less time than I used to have, but I mean, the Dominican life is all about protecting people for contemplative life and then trying to create space for communication through teaching and, and writing at a measured pace. Uh, so I, I'm protected from this. And I look at my friends who are subject to the kind of uh, productivity norms and also the challenge often of having families uh, where, you know, of course, that's a beautiful and fundamental vocation, more fundamental in some ways than uh, the vocation to teach, although the vocation to teach is also oriented towards the truth, which in a way transcends the family. So that's complicated. And they're trying to, you know, live that balance and equilibrium. And that's an enormous challenge. They have my full estimation. Um, I think that there partly is, I mean, here's the problem. A young academic has to do two things. They have to survive the tenure process by uh, placating the colleagues they have with the idea that they have a sufficient degree of, of commonality with them, that they're worthy of being part of the citizenship of the university and being productive enough that they seem to be a, a producer of research and communicator of uh, rare knowledge and a, in some sense, a, a, a person who acquires understanding that they can communicate effectively. They have to do all that in a short amount of time. And then they have to, after that, in a way, pivot to being a little bit more of a paced wisdom figure and still try to be productive. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a kind of growth and maturity in the arc of the vocation of an academic, uh, which especially when it's you know, allied with having a family is enormously challenging, but also very beautiful because it's like the intellectual wisdom to, to steward diverse goods, how to like be married and have children, to who you are love and devoted to, but also have a, an active research component where you're seeking the truth for its own sake and seeking to communicate it, where you're also teaching and taking responsibility for the souls entrusted to you in the, in, to the measure and degree you're supposed to. And then you're also working with your colleagues to create a healthy climate of the search for the truth. This is a part of the frustrating problem of being a human animal instead of an angel is we're much more complicated ontologically. So we have to go for more goods and try to intelligently balance them you know, and then pray, pray for wisdom to do it well. And I don't, I, I think that the more we can get away from dependence on, I say this as a person who has, you know, t I have as many problems as most people like, you know, looking at, you know, I don't know what, you know, YouTube or Facebook or just reading the news. But I think the more we can diminish our um, addictions to uh, media sources and get enough sleep, get up early, pray, take time to read before we go in to do our administrative work, Try to write a little bit in the morning or in the evening at some point when we can try to carve out you know strategies for having contemplative time i think that that's essential and we have to make sacrifices to have contemplative time of study of the of writing and of and of a prayer as part of our life hmm. so wisdom humility and maybe some asceticism uh, and it can hurt as well uh, for some some discipline for our time let me read one more question to share, uh, which, which uh, I thought was important and, and touches on a lot of the issues that we've been able to discuss. And we want to thank Father Thomas Joseph for his time. This last question from a graduate student who's Catholic at a secular university. How can we overcome the skepticism you mentioned, even in ourselves? I am Catholic and trying to engage the Catholic intellectual tradition as a graduate student in literature at a secular school. But the skepticism about whether we can really get at reality is leaving traces on the way I think. Oh, excellent. Well, the first thing this person needs to do is sign up for summer uh, graduate study, graduate programs with the Thomistic Institute and other kinds of institutions that provide a forum to really meet with like-minded, um, extremely brilliant intellectual graduate students and explore the problem personally and intellectually in a, in a healthy academic context. I mean, the remedy exists for this. It's not like we're just talking about something that should exist. There really are great programs for people like this uh, that the Timistic Institute and other, uh, other institutes provide. So that's the first thing is like, it, you know, when you see the means, take it. If you're sick, go to the doctor, right? So if you have, if you self-diagnosing is having a problem skeptic of skepticism you need to treat, go to the people who can help you and get involved especially when you know there's scholarships and it's going to be fun and you know you're going to learn a lot 
I, I and then, you know, there's a lot online too that's now can help people, you know, who are brilliantly academically inclined in domains other than philosophy or theology to have a real access, you know, through like the Thomistic Institute podcasts to real instruction in non-skeptical forms of philosophical thinking. Um, but I will also say graduate students in particular have to be, they have to kind of show a faith in history, a, kind of a patience, a faith, and a hope. Because we you know when you're in graduate student in graduate school, I, I certainly experienced this writing about Aquinas in theology at Oxford in the 90s and being told, why are you studying dinosaur theology? This has no application to people's lives today. Nobody's interested in this stuff. You're completely individual alone. You know, your Catholic tradition has no, you know, status in terms of like contemporary theological discussions. And you look at it 30 years later, it's like all come it's like a huge resurgence of interest in Thomistic theology, which has happened, which is amazing. I mean, I would never have predicted even 15 years ago. So I think, you know, sometimes when you weather the storm and you stay true to your principles and you stay on a certain kind of, you know, let's say literary criticism line of thinking, which tries to find the good, the true, and the beautiful in classical literature or contemporary literature, and both negatively and positively illustrated, and you see the force and depth of true poetics, uh, in the end, you will be able to communicate with that to your students, and you will be able to change their lives. And your friends who maybe are more faddish and less rooted, and who are swept up into the customs of contemporary trends, skepticism, and you know, politicization of literature, that will all fade and really, I think, not bear much fruit. So you partly have to realize that like you will eventually sow seeds in people's minds, uh, like, you know, kind of like the, the patient farmer, and it will grow. There'll be immense fruitfulness in the soil of the souls of future students because of your fidelity, patience and hope in your in terms of your own discipline taken seriously. You have to be as a young academic, a kind of visionary. You have to believe in the force of the truth and you have to be willing to be like slightly prophetic, like detested. For your fidelity to something profound and be a little bit magnanimous not in the sense of overly insecure and all overly defensive uh, but like also slightly scornful of those who think that your own intellectual propheticism is misplaced it is well placed and you have to be strong you have to keep going and you'll see the fruits of it in 10 years and even sooner and you'll see your friends who are more skeptical about it look at you later and say you know i think you you probably were right about that kind of classical framework for interpreting literature and so forth so you need to discover that, you need to go deeper in that vein, and you need to be faithful to that vision. And you'll find that God will help you if you pray to God and ask for divine light, you know, natural light and supernatural light. You'll find your way, but you need friends, you need colleagues, and you need good, you know, customs and structures. And that's where these, these you know, Catholic intellectual programs are really important and they're very helpful. Thank you, Father Thomas Joseph. I think that's a great note to end on the value of, in other words, of seeking out intellectual community that might not be coterminous with one's you know, department or school or university, but very well might be found at the Thomistic Institute or some other institutes of Catholic intellectual life. I'm thinking of Bloom and Christie Institute at University of Chicago or Collegium Institute at University of Pennsylvania. There's some different sorts of opportunities like this around the nation, uh, Harvard Catholic Forum and Nova Forum at USC. Thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing your experience, your insights, um, we should let you get on with your evening now. I fear it's growing late in Rome as the light is dimming there, but we're very grateful for your time and for the dialogue today. David, I'm so grateful to be present with you all today and really honored, and, and I wish you every best wish for all the next phases of the NOVA Forum. Thank you, and thank you for all of us, for, for all of you who are joining us today, and um, we will conclude our time here. Thank you.